As technologies and geopolitics change, so does the nature of warfare. Welcome back to On Future War, a series sponsored by Cubic Defense that looks at emerging technologies and how they may affect peer and near peer level conflict in the future, particularly in the Indo Pacific region, with a specific focus on military tactics, operations, and strategy, and their interaction with the other instruments of national security policy. The future is now. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Welcome back to phase two of On Future War. Today, Paco and Scar continue on from last episode's discussion of fifth gen fighters to discuss drones or unmanned aerial systems, their history, capabilities, and utility in potential peer level conflict. This is Authentic. Welcome to On Future War, a series of discussions on critical issues of national security for today and beyond. And with a focus on the Indo-Pacific region, I'm your host, Mike Benitez. And last episode, we left off talking about fighters, fighter jets, all good things about fighters, fourth gen, fifth gen, and how they can all work together. We ended up with a tease about today's topic, which is drones, past, present, and most importantly, we're going to talk about the future. And since we're picking up where we left off, our guest needs an introduction because we had him on the last episode too. It's our resident raptor and drone expert, Scar. Welcome back, Scar. Paco, thanks for letting me come back once again. Stoked to talk about uh, how we're enabling combat capability with unmanned systems. Let's do this thing. Okay. Unmanned system, drone, UAV, ABC, RPV. We don't know. Let's go down the laundry list. What is the terminology? What are we actually calling them today? Because it changes about every three years or so. Yeah, I think right now the term of art is remotely piloted aircraft. You often also hear uncrewed air vehicle or UAV. You know, it's interesting when you take a look back at history, it, as much as you and I debate out in national parlance, you can hear a number of different terms. There's actually been a whole growth industry around what do we actually call these things? If you actually look all the way back to the 19 teens, we were experimenting with unmanned systems. And the very first one was actually a, a one-way weapon that we called an aerial torpedo. And so that is how we actually started was pulling on naval terminology. And then after that, it turned into pilotless aircraft or pilotless airplane. And then by the 1930s, we were already using the term drone. Based on research, that this seems to be the term that has survived the longest. I think it's it's fallen into sci-fi support and it leans in a little bit more on it's an unmanned system, may or may not have intelligence, but it drones around kind of thing. We then throughout history continued to grow in Vietnam. We used them principally for ISR and there were surveillance drones, a special purpose aircraft, a remotely piloted vehicle. All those were used all the way up until unmanned aerial vehicle or unmanned combat air vehicle, collaborative combat aircraft for you know next generation stuff. All the while to say, I don't know that it really matters as long as the person you're talking to understands what you're getting after. So for right now, unmanned aerial vehicle, remotely piloted aircraft, synonymous for what we're talking about. All right. Drones. We're just going to call them drones, and then we'll make a distinction, I think, maybe a little bit later in the conversation. I'm down with drones. Easy peasy. Too many acronyms and too many syllables. It's like a George Carlin conversation. You add more syllables uh, over as you go over time. Okay, so drones, that sounds dumb, and you kind of mentioned that a little bit ago. I think of drones traditionally as being dull, dirty, and dangerous, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that's not necessarily always true tomorrow because now you're going to add the fourth D, which I like to call it the difficult. And so what, what adds to that difficult missions on top of the dull missions, the dirty missions and the dangerous missions 
is the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is the difference between remotely piloted aircraft and an autonomous aircraft. So both drones, but maybe architected or arranged in a different way, right? The drone that is remotely piloted versus autonomous has everything to do with human interaction. So let's take a look at the RQ-1, the Predator, the first, you know, long loiter ISR aircraft that we used in the post-Cold War era. You know, started in the 1990s in Serbia, conducting ISR missions, and that would be something that has a pilot or operator and maybe a sensor operator or other crewmates that are back hauled somewhere uh, principally right now at Creech Air Force Base, but there are other locations all around the world and within the United States where you are still going to have a pilot, somebody who has a stick and a throttle. If you can find a bunch of pictures online, you actually find like History Channel documentaries, Military Channel, et cetera, that show how in a GCS or ground control station, you'll have somebody with a stick and throttle looking at computer monitors, receiving video feeds where they're flying an air vehicle. It just is from their GCS versus an autonomous system. And that and actually is important to note, Paco, for further conversation. We're going to talk about where that pilot is. Are they in the loop? Or are they on the loop? Or are they off the loop? So I actually want to detour here for just a second. Well, which real quick, just to foot stomp yeah. this, though, it's not just see so the MQ-9 and you, you talk about the pilot and the GCS, but the pilot's just piloting there's a person who sits next to him just to run the sensors, right? So it's actually two people to operate the MQ-9 or MQ-1. Yeah, and so when we say it's it's an RPA, remotely piloted aircraft or UAV, unmanned air vehicle, like remotely piloted is true, but it's also, yeah, remotely sensor operated. Remotely, we leverage munitions. And so our fire munitions, missiles, drop bombs, et cetera. And so there, there's a lot to cover in there, but you're exactly right. The crew is deeply inside the decision-making and articulation of the air vehicle, but they are just physically removed from where the air vehicle is. That would be remotely piloted, and that is the operators are in the loop. They are deeply inside the loop of the decision-making. Similar to if you fly a Cessna around, you are inside the loop of that decision-making. You are critical to the success and survivability of that mission. Now let's actually talk about humans that are on the loop Now you're getting into much more semi-autonomous or autonomous. Maybe you can call it automated. And Paco, I want to hear your thoughts on the definition of automated versus autonomy is (laughs) because that's also important to lay flat because if you might actually have a conversation about what you think is an autonomous aircraft, but they're calling it an automated and those are two different things. And so let's talk about the human that is on the loop where you are maybe kind of like a global hawk using a keyboard mouse clicking on the map, saying go fly to this waypoint with this GPS, latitude, longitude, elevation, fly this heading, but you have no stick and throttle. And it will fly that route, maybe that black line say that you pre-mission planned, and it will do that absent of any human interaction other than maybe monitoring. That would be what I would call human on the loop. Like I said, the best example would be the Global Hawk RQ-4. Then finally, you have this human that is off the loop. That would be a truly independent thinking, independent decision-making air vehicle. I would call that autonomy and is autonomous air vehicle where you maybe point it in a direction or it takes off on its own. It flies its mission on its own. I think we would all agree that legally you wouldn't want it to employ ordinance absent of human interaction, but it, in a very technical sense, there's nothing stopping it from doing that and then flying back home. That would be the full scale And there's a lot of gray in the middle there of what a remotely piloted human deeply in the loop to an autonomous human completely off the loop system. Paco, feedback, pushback, thoughts on that? Wow, lots of unpack there. Yeah, uh, everything you said, I'll align with that. We'll talk about different levels of autonomy. I think that's a good way to probably frame it. But before we get to that, let's back up just a little bit. So when we think about like the global war on terror, the past generation of war fighting in the Middle East. If you were in the Army or the Marine Corps, your organic drones were the, the RQ-7 Shadow and the RQ-21 Blackjack. Yep. Those things were ubiquitous everywhere, flying around a couple hundred feet off the ground, a couple miles away from where your operators were. And you have someone looking at a sensor feed, which is usually like just a camera, 
and a radio just kind of back. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's manually controlled flying around, getting some intelligence or situational awareness. And then you have your, as you said, your MQ1 and MQ9s that are flying around kind of the same thing, a little bit bigger. So they fly a little bit higher, go a little bit further, bigger sensor, pretty much doing the same thing. They evolved into doing dynamic targeting. And so they could, with that sensor, could see a target and then drop their, their weapons. The big value of that being mostly they were doing dull missions, right? Hours, like sometimes 20 plus hours staring at a mud hut building that, you know, that sensor soak and pattern of life, the unblinking eye is what everyone used. To. So very, very dull. I feel sorry for people who had to stare at that video feed for 20 hours. What did you call it in the AOC? What were the, the speeds of the AOC? What are they called? Pred porn. <laughs> yeah, the pred, pred porn. Yeah. People just watching that all day long, getting the like, glued to the feeds, just watching stuff happen. Yeah. It's like big brother. It's like real time. What's going on? You have like 30 TVs on the wall and yeah. And like commanders couldn't get enough of that junk, right? Like once you give it a little bit, you can't get enough of it. I need my ISR soak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, then you had the uh, above that. So even bigger, flying even higher, it was the Global Hawks. That thing's flying around at 50,000 feet plus and probably the dullest mission in the entire war over Iraq and Afghanistan was actually flown by the Global Hawk, which you think of the Global Hawk as not necessarily an overland kind of capability but it flew with the bacon, the bacon configuration. You remember that scar, the uh, battlefield airborne communication node. So it basically flew around as a big radio relay and it would just orbit for 20 or 30 hours, way, way, way high in the sky. So it could translate incompatible radios and networks between the air force and the Navy and the army. So we could all talk to each other. So one of the dullest missions you can think of just orbiting all day, just to be a radio relay, perfect mission for a, on the loop, somewhat automated drone where I don't have to fly in orbit. I can just push a button. It'll hold there. It'll do its thing. You couldn't use it for anything that was dynamic or complex because it just did not have the automation or the autonomy to do that. Right? No, you're, you're exactly right. And I think that that is where, as we get into these more complex missions that you and I may talk about here, you are going to want to still think about how a human could interact and support. Because as they get more difficult, I, actually, I like the way that you framed it, you actually may still need deep understanding and connection with, with a human. And I think what you've also articulated there well, which we breezed right on by, would be the common nomenclature surrounding the various groups of unmanned systems. And so we have group one through five. It is principally anchored on physical size, weight, and performance. It has nothing to do with the sensors, has nothing to do whether it's an automated or human in the loop, remotely piloted air vehicle. So as an example, a group one would be your DJI quadcopter. Well used, proliferated in Ukraine. Perfect example, or a DJI Phantom, or some of the smaller agricultural drones you'll see flying around farms, uh, also group one, typically battery power. Based on the black and white characterization it's under 20 pounds flies usually in uncontrolled airspace so under 1200 feet in less than 100 knots that's 1200 feet agl then once you get into group two up to 55 pounds going a little bit higher maybe controlled airspace 3500 feet that is now you're getting into those larger crop dusting quads um, some of the smaller to medium-sized fixed wing air vehicles then once you get into group three you're not going to class a airspace you're under 18,000 feet MSL, but you can fly up to 250 knots, less than a ton, so less than 1,300 pounds or so. A perfect example are the Blackjack, the Shadows, the VBAT is another example of a Group 3 UAS. Certainly higher performance, greater swap C as far as size, weight, power, and cooling for sensors. You're getting up and closer to the Predator Reaper drone class. That is what you would call the Predators of Group 4, so under 18,000 feet, lighter weight, fixed wing. And then once you get into group five above 18,000 feet, any airspeed, your MQ nines, which go into class A airspace, your global Hawks, and then any of the collaborative combat aircraft that are coming down the pike, those would be classified simply by physical performance standards as group five aircraft. Yeah. Let's talk about group five for just a minute. And then we're going to go all the way down the food chain to group one, and then we'll work away all the way back up to group five. So, so one of the things is a podcast, so use your imagination. So MQ-1, 
an MQ-9 and a Global Hawk. If you notice, they all relatively look kind of the same, right? So they have long, straight-ish wings, and they're designed and optimized for endurance. And the reason why that they look that way is they're designed that way. That was the mission they were for, right? And there's a lot to be said of the, the software and the way that it's on the loop, in the loop, or off the loop kind of shapes what the mission is, which then informs what the vehicle will look like. So for a generation, all of our large drones have been these slow, lumbering, long loiter, sensor dwelling type drones, and they're optimized to carry payloads at high altitudes for a long time. And really that was kind of, I think that was pretty well dialed in. I mean, I don't, we're pretty well optimized in that department for group five. So then you go, well, if we change the software and we start adding more advanced software and I can do more things to the point early about difficult things, well, now I actually have to go back and revisit the design because the mission's gonna change, which means the design of the vehicle is gonna change. And this is where we get into the collaborative combat aircraft, autonomous collaborative platforms, and all these concepts you see coming out, they start to look way different than the group five drones that you think of from the early 2000s. So we'll get to that in just a second. You asked me earlier, and I wanted to double back with this. That was my terrible segue to answer something that I, you asked me way back when, was my thoughts on autonomy. So it's not black and white, and it's not binary, right? So there's levels. And so the, the best example that exists in the NATO and the US military has not adopted it yet is the Society of Automotive Engineers. The SAE has these levels of automation for driving turns out and there's five of them think of level one is the things that you when you push cruise control and you can just set it and forget it until you have to stop or change lanes or you have traffic that someone in front of you and we've all been there you set your cruise control right where you want to be and it's one mile an hour off just one from the person in front of you and you start closing that gap and you're like son of a and you got to go and you got to you got to inject your you know push a button change it by a mile an hour and try to dial it in so you have that perfect following distance and you can just then set it and forget it so you really can't ever forget it you just keep setting it and resetting it so you get to like level two level three and now i have that adaptive cruise control where i have a sensor it's percepting the environment it's maintaining that spacing and you'll see that lane control adaptive cruise control things like that when you add more and more sensors then you get to level three which is in certain conditions that can do certain things automatically right now in the united states there's only one state with one type of car that i can think of that's actually certified to operate on u.s public roads with autonomy and it's not tesla <laughs> so it's like it's this is hard stuff like all of tesla as we're recording this the most advanced self-driving stuff that Tesla has is technically level two automation. All right, so we're talking about five levels of automation. Five, all the way at the end, is you get into the car and it does everything. Gets you to your destination, avoids traffic, all conditions, whether it's dirt roads, paved roads, day, night, snow, sleet, fog, hail, doesn't matter, all right? That is your level five. Nothing is level five right now. There's things that are in the level three space, We'll see what happens. You know, it's it's rapidly changing. Level five is really, really hard. Turns out though, aircraft in the air and aviation, you know, a little bit of big sky theory, but it's also a lot less stuff to worry about. So it's a lot less cluttered environment and it frees you up to be able to do much more compelling things on that levels of automation, even though it's it's ground transportation as a framework. But if you apply it to the air, it's kind of the same thing. So you can do with the same types of technology that are maybe limited by just the nature of the environment for automobiles for level two, you could take that to like a high level three, low level four even in the autonomy space for air vehicles. And this is where the, the compelling case comes in for collaborative combat aircraft and autonomous collaborative platforms, right? 100%, 100%. And I think this is where, you know, the a shout out to, Air Forces Association, Mitchell Institute, where they started some of the conversation around maybe these groupings. And this is why I highlighted the group one through five, and we can go back down the scale here in a sec, are only based on physical attributes and have nothing to do or any connection with sensor capabilities, autonomy, cyber capabilities, munitions, et cetera. 
And so that scaling of the autonomy, I agree with you because what's interesting is, and people should disassociate grouping of UAS with its inherent capability and or lethality, certainly in modern day, because a group four and RQ1 from 1999 is actually way less capable than a group one DJI with an RPG attached to it in 2024. And so like the grouping of number higher doesn't necessarily mean better. There's a lot that needs to be, you know, looked under the hood when you actually want to talk about capabilities associated with the grouping. Yeah. We went from bigger is better. I'd say that's probably like early 21st century was we can build bigger drones. We're going to use satellites to communicate with them and fly them across the world. Like that was a technological Marvel, right? Amazing. Even still. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. Right. Well, then it just became like the norm. And so everyone assumes that there's going to be a drone overhead controlled by, you know, a satellite ground control station, half a world away. Right. And you're always going to have that assured communication. No one's going to jam it. No one's going to mess with it. No one's going to shoot down your lumbering drone that has no defensive systems because at the time, who's going to, no one had any weapons to shoot them down. Right. So if you're out of small arms fire, like you're pretty safe. And so, uh, you know, MQ9 can sit up there for a while. And as you know, in the past, you know, nine months or so, like, Oh, turns out <laughs> there's a lot of things in the world that can reach out and touch you if you fly too close to them. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no joke. Like the worst in the counterterrorism fight, the our group four, group five, and like really group three UASs from nine eleven to twenty twenty two ruled the day in the counterterrorism fight. Permissive environment, everything was great. And the only signature they really cared about was their acoustic, because they didn't want to spook or it, like let the people know who they were monitoring that they were being monitored. Because once you get the Predator Reaper far enough away, you can't hear it, you can't see it, but their staring EOIR sensors can see and monitor you. And so as a stealth guy, I worry about radar, IR, visual, and then I never really worried about acoustic because I, I love making noise. That's actually completely different for these UASs. They cared in a permissive environment very little about radar, cared very little about IR, cared very little about visual but they cared a lot about acoustic signature. So, so just something to consider, that doesn't matter anymore because in a contested environment, they're going to reach out and see you via radar and IR well before they hear you. And so it's just, it's a flipping flopping of what the priorities are as we move forward. Yeah. All right, let's, there was another D that I didn't actually mention yet. And I think it's, uh, it's really important. And you mentioned it a little bit about drones in U Ukraine, DGI uh, specifically. The other D is disposable. Yeah. So, <laughs> If I have something that is commercial based, widely distributed, and I can turn it into a kinetic, now you have the, another capability, which is these thousands and thousands, like 10,000 drones a month in Ukraine that are being burned through by using them as you know, basically one-way kinetic vehicles. You can put a, a payload, whether it's a pack of C4 or a, a 155 or just a, a mortar, and then take this thing off with like an FPV uh, type thing and just, I can just ram it right to the back of a tank, take a tank out. I can hover over a ground position and just drop a grenade. And I think all of us have seen those videos online, but that's commercial distributed kinetic. So the disposable drone era is really what we've seen the last probably three years, right? No doubt. And it actually started with, it became pretty reasonably publicized in the Armenia Azerbaijan conflict this predated Ukraine. Yeah, that's when the rebels with the drones basically like destroyed all the tanks, right? And it was in the I believe in the Nagoro Karabakh region. I'm probably mispronouncing that like crazy. No, that's right. Yep, that's right. I'm glad you said it because I would have gotten it wrong. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to look like an idiot, so it's okay. <laughs> you gotta maintain at least the veil of not being an idiot. So the uh border region contested between the two countries and they used, again, just you can go online, order these drones to your front door, go up into the mountains and make a big strategic level difference. Maybe, as you talked about, we're, there are a bunch of studies out there from think tanks and other observers in the Ukrainian conflict. 10,000 a month is what I've also heard. There's a grayscale around there because I don't think anybody actually truly knows. But your your ability to make a difference with a quad in a pack of C4 also has everything to do with the permissivity of the environment. 
Yeah, Ukraine this year is forecasted to go through a million. That's their goal is a million drones a year. That's a lot. Some of them never make it to the target. Why? Because of the jamming. The RF spectrum becomes increasingly challenged there. So it becomes a non-permissive environment, which then further challenges these off-the-shelf capabilities. There is a real there there. There's indisputable evidence, as you alluded to, but the conflict is also changing. So these group ones are getting pushed further out. You actually also find necessity is the mother of invention and innovation. And so you can find some of the larger quads are radio relays for the smaller ones so they can reach out further because many of these DJIs or we're using that term as a synonymous term for all like group one, small group one quads for those who are listening. They're really just focused with line of sight radios. They actually don't have a ton of power, but if you can get something up above the horizon a couple hundred feet with a radio relay, suddenly they can go miles and miles and miles and reach a lot further. Yeah. And the phase that we're in with the war, it, it actually started with the group ones and like, and, you know, that's most of them right now. But now that they're climbing up the aviation food chain, like what else can we uh, turn into unmanned vehicles and send across the lines? And as you get bigger vehicles, your swap goes up. So size, weight and power. I've either got a bigger radio, a bigger warhead. I've got a bigger fuel tank and I can go further. And so like your group ones, which are limited to call it 10 miles you know, from the front lines. And so as long as you have a FIBA and a FLOT, if you will, that are pretty close together. Like, yeah, the group ones make a lot of sense. If you want to go do like strategic interdiction and go like cut off supply chains and factories and you're doing long range strike, you got to go pull out the bigger drones or you convert your civil airplanes into drones, which is what we've seen in the last probably three months or so, right? April 2nd, April 2nd, we saw videos come back of a Cessna flying into an oil depot in Russia. So behind the border, certainly behind the front line. And you just strap a, a radio and an unmanned kit to control the yoke in the cockpit. And suddenly you load that bad boy up to his gross weight with explosives and you fly and you just go. Even your, you know, you can turn like manned aircraft into optionally piloted, which opens up a brain. So is that Cessna? Is that a group three UAS now? Is it a group four UAS or is it a, manned air vehicle that was turned unmanned there's a lot to be answered there and i don't think you could find consensus just yet on some of that yeah it's ongoing just like the uh, and the houthis are doing almost the same thing in the red sea they're just trying to attack the shipping lanes and yeah so commercial distributed kinetics with the group ones and then going back up to the group threes and group fives that's kind of a trend item right now with drones but none of those really have autonomy right they're not smart they're just repurposed dumb drones if you will going to do a different mission you would call those human or on the loop certainly humans are deeply involved just as on the loop yep no independent decision making so you're you're an air force guy aviation background i am and when you look at like the stressing use case if you went to the extreme end of like the most difficult air mission this is and we'll talk about this for a little bit because i think it helps frame like the value of the future the most difficult air mission that I can think of. And I was asked this the other day and I was like, instantly like it's seed. It's gotta be seed. The most complex, wildly difficult dynamic mission that exists that you can do in the air domain. You'd like to think it's dogfighting. Counter air is important. Interdiction is important, but the suppression of enemy air defenses has all of that mixed together with something that's trying to shoot you back from the air, from the ground. It's, it's everything all put in the one. It's the most complex mission there is scar. Agree or disagree? As as a Raptor guy, I know it, it probably swallow a little bit of pride, maybe, or maybe, maybe not. What do you think? Certainly, if you're fighting the war in every dimension. So if we're going in AI, so it's it's only an air to air engagement. That's you don't have to worry about things shooting in the ground. I'm cool with that being less complex. If you're only going after stuff that's on the ground and it's a permissive air environment, I'm also cool with that being less complex. So when you bring the ivory dimension into play, I would certainly agree that that brings the complexity up to the greatest level. So I agree with that. All right. So as humans, and you've probably seen this in these you know large force packages and putting things together and, you know, you would go out and call it the Nullis range with F-22s and F-16s and F-15s and everyone has their different package leads. And they're all focused on these missions. And it's so complex, like having one person to try to navigate contesting of the 
air to air fight, the surface to air fight, and then where are my targets? Where are my tankers? What's my comm plan, the fuel plan? It is really, really complex. Do you think that that is where autonomy can help? As a clarifying question in front of the listener, I just want to confirm you're talking the mission command or the execution at a lower level than mission command. We can go any, any way of the conversation. I think there's value on both sides of it from the mission level to the execution level, like at the edge, right? Whether you're a, a wingman or a flight lead or, you know, a package lead or a quote, a mission commander, like those levels of integration for various levels of autonomy. And that's really where you get into like, how do I build a force to enable these drones? This is a drone episode to drones to go do these wildly complex, challenging things that, oh, by the way, if I take the human out of the equation, although it's wickedly complex to do that, it actually simplifies a ton of other variables in the conflict, like risk to mission, risk to force, and things that as a combatant commander that you know the engineer doesn't have to worry about, but the person who's running the war certainly cares about is like first principles. Is like, where's my rescue force? If I'm gonna commit a person, what's the plan to go get him if he gets shot down? All of these like second, third order effects that just the tooth to tail of putting someone in a pink body in the harm's way in, in that environment has so many other things that go along with it. It's really hard for most people, I think, to think through because you're not making those decisions to put someone's life in harm's way. You also have the obligation to like give them the benefit to survive and persist if they get shot down, right? No doubt. It doesn't stretch the imagination to think about plausible scenarios in the near term and certainly the principal AOR that we think about in this podcast, the Indo-Pacific Theater, where the levels of risk would be defined by the combatant commander as extreme. That is a level of risk that a combatant commander can buy off on, which assumes high levels of attrition. But if the mission is important enough, they can say, I'm going to go execute it even with the highest level of risk, again, which we define in the DOD as extreme. And you know, you, you look everybody in the eye, you go, many of you are not coming back. So how are we going to do this? Well, with the advent of the autonomy, as you're describing, and the capacity for some of these sensors to provide meaningful perception, we can then layer some of that risk and leverage some of that risk onto these unmanned systems. So let's take an example. In this seed scenario, you have multiple layers of surface air missile systems or SAMs that have various degrees of reach and also use maybe differing RF spectrums, which are all important. If you want to kick in that first door, so to say, the long range SAMs to enable you to get closer to the target and maybe then enable greater levels of air superiority at the time and place of our choosing, it would be way better to leverage that enduring SAM engagement zone or missile engagement zone, the MES, on an unmanned system for the duration of the engagement than the manned system. And the unmanned system, under the assumption it has relevant sensors on board, could potentially go through the kill chain itself in order to find, fix, track, target, engage, maybe, and then maybe even do post-engagement assessment, all without any humans being involved. And so we achieved operational success and we achieved exactly what we need to do in order to achieve our political ends for that particular engagement, but without having to actually put anybody in harm's way, which would just like you said, stretch our CSAR, combat search and rescue, stretch our logistics chain and stretch also our manpower when they maybe should be used in, in other ways. Yeah. And it's not just about attrition. There's a few different elements of attrition. The one that really, for this conversation, reconstitution. The difference between shooting down, call it a, let's pick on F-16 today. <laughs> so we... <laughs> I'm down, always down. Always down to pick on the Viper. So if a manned, piloted F-16 gets shot down, and there is the reconstitution of the platform. And so let's say, you know, Lockheed, it'll, it'll take them 15 months to build a, an aircraft. We'll get it back into the fleet. We have a couple thousand F-16s floating around. Not too much of a dent. But that pilot, like reconstituting that pilot to put him back in a combat line, that takes some time, assuming that he's healthy, recoverable, and you get them all that repatriated and go through a whole, that whole thing. Like he's out of commission for a while, right? So even though you're not, 
you know, he's not a casualty, but he is a casualty of the war and the fact that he's taken out of the fight. So not a fatality, but a casualty. And if you have an automated or autonomy in a F-16 like thing and it gets shot down, yes, you do have to reconstitute the vehicle, but if you have smaller design vehicles that are designed in a way that can be rapidly built or scale in production and they're not built to you know last for 50 years like our man platforms are and they don't have all the survivability requirements that our man platforms have your reconstitution of your quote ai pilot is instantaneous right it's software you can just copy and paste it right that's right <laughs> and so you it, you copy and paste it and when you load it into a replacement air vehicle that comes off the line, it actually didn't lose any proficiency. And so like its capability that it had two weeks ago under the assumption it hasn't been updated is still relevant now. And so it doesn't, you know, as a father who doesn't work out nearly as much, I can tell you muscles atrophy uh, because I don't work out nearly as much (laughs) as I should. The dad bod doesn't grow itself. You got to make sure that happens. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You got to just like (laughs) accept what it is. Versus the unmanned system and its software decision-making autonomy doesn't atrophy. It has its capabilities, whether it sits on the shelf for a year or is used that day. And so it really has the opportunity to up the game and ensure a higher level of consistent capability, just like you're getting at in comparison to manned systems in some of these scenarios. And that, it's not just the atrophy and the consistency. There's also the, well, I guess it is consistency, but the you don't know, and you know this being in a, in a fighter squadron, you can look at the scheduling board, and, and if you know you've been around the people enough, you know like where people's strengths and weaknesses are for prepared for different missions and things. And like, yeah, totally get it. So there's a variance of like the capabilities, even within like the world's best fighter squadron. Like there's still like, the best of the best. And then there's like the okayest of the best, right? Where (laughs) in that level of variability of the human component is baked into a lot of the ways that tactics and integration work because you have to build it for that variability of mind, like the lowest common denominator, like we have to be able to do this on any given day. That is the standard, the standard being the baseline. So there is a little bit of pad of the pad, right? So you're sacrificing optimization of tactical execution to make sure it's scalability across the people component because there's there's a human component of this, right? If you have autonomy and you know exactly what it can and can't do, and you can copy and paste it where everyone in your formation has literally to the, you know, ones and zeros, the exact same brain from the AI pilot, you can optimize tactics to execute something in a way that you could never do with the human because just the human element just has that variability. So it's not just the atrophy, it's that continuity and that standard that you can replicate with a very assured knowing of what the capabilities and limitations are. No doubt. I mean, perfect examples would be, you think about the peak of athletic demonstration, at least in the United States, usually is the most popular sport is the National Football League, NFL. Are you going to talk about Michigan? Are you going to talk about Michigan? Uh, this I wasn't going to talk about Michigan, but I'm more than happy to anytime. <laughs> the uh, uh, you have a wide scale of capability, even within an NFL team, right? You could have Tom Brady, the greatest of all time. And you also have the dude who just got pulled off the practice squad. Not to say that he's terrible or anything, but there's a wide scale of capability and capacity, even on a peak performing unit that you watch every weekend in the fall and winter. And the other thing too, I'll say is an amazing demonstration of how you have to allow the human to maybe think and perceive and react. There's a scene in the movie about Sully's landing on the Hudson, where Tom Hanks plays Sully. And it it demonstrates how the FAA was trying to grill those guys. And they showed, hey, if he had made the correct decision instantaneously, he maybe, maybe could have made it back. And he goes, no, per the FAA, you have to allow me 30 seconds. You have to allow me 30 seconds to like assess what's going on and make a decision. We call the aviate, navigate, communicate, and you prioritize and figure out what's going on. Maintain air archive control, analyze the situation, take proper action, land as soon as conditions permit. If there is an autonomous system, they can perceive and make a decision instantaneously. And so that grayscale of like allowing the human gray matter between your ears to figure out what's going on can happen at gigahertz, you know, trillions of, of computations per second versus what we do, which in my case is incredibly slow. 
And so it is, uh, it has a lot of opportunity to smooth that out. Exactly. You said. This is a long winded way to say, I agree with you. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's go back and uh, we're going to dial it back just a bit because we talked about the last, you know, 10 minutes or so, like how autonomy is going to replace the human in the cockpit and how it's so much better. So now let's go, well, maybe, and, you know, maybe in way off somewhere in the future, there's definitely like use cases, really, we're talking about level five driving here, back to use the analogy earlier, long way out. That's very visionary. The near term, you have narrow, I think, use cases. And then you have basically the advanced chess principle, which is the human and the machine together make a better team than either one of them would have made on their own. So let's talk about how we integrate these next generation drones that have autonomy with manned aircraft, such as the illustrious Raptor or maybe the F-35. What are your thoughts? So as we can, I think, all agree, conflict and warfare is inherently a human endeavor. So you always are going to want to have humans involved. There is little to zero appetite for independent decision making and certainly to apply lethal force when it comes to these high performance systems. And so how could you envision the value that they provide. And as you alluded to, there are studies out there where a person augmented by a machine and its capabilities are way greater in their capacity to do and achieve their outcomes than a person that's on, on its own, or if you just send that drone out alone and unafraid. You want to have the good of both that can smooth out the deltas between. And so how I envision that integration would we say you have a you have an F-22 and you would use a collaborative combat aircraft or a drone in this case as an augmentation to that human's ability to perceive and make decisions and execute its mission. So it is just an extension of that person's capacity to sense and make sense and then make decisions. I always fall back on what you and I were taught in the operational world which is perception, decision, execution. Those who have maybe heard me in the previous episode, I always fall back on that because it is maybe not the perfect framework, but it's not unreasonable to bend things into. So perception, how do you see what's going on? What is going on in the world? What are your sensors telling you? What are your eyeballs telling you? What are your ears telling you? Decision, now that you've perceived what's going on, how are you gonna, or what is the decision you're going to make? Or what is the decision you have made based on what you see? And then execution, how did you execute the decision based on your perception? All those things lead into perception is the most important thing we can get right. Because then I can assume under relevant training of an autonomous agent or system, it will make a correct decision because we'll, we won't allow somebody to feel that won't. And then the autonomous system will execute it way better than my ham fist itself could ever do it. Way more better on angle, way more better on energy control, way more better on G control, way more better on timeliness of weapons employment. Yeah. But it all comes back to that perception. Yeah, it turns out that's the hardest part to solve and the most nuance. And in conflict, that is the thing, even for like human versus human, that's the thing that everyone's trying to mess with is perception. If you can alter someone's perceptions of what's going on, you immediately have an advantage. So like electronic warfare, if you're jamming the sensors, you're going to skew the perception. And so there's like the next level of, of there's the, the game in the game of just understanding the perception side of the equation just right. And if you look at DARPA ACE, like DARPA ACE, for, for those who aren't tracking, was the, uh, the AI piloted uh, F-16. The Air Force was flying with DARPA and had the AI pilot versus the human pilot dogfight, F-16 versus F-16. One of the things that they decided early on in that program to do, if you look at the pictures of the, the X-62 Vista on the wing, they carry a, a pod, it's called a slate pod, and it's feeding a perception side of the autonomy. And so the perception is being provided because the focus of the program was cognition and action. And so could it make the right decisions and how would it execute those decisions? Because they knew that like, the perception thing is so wickedly, it's a different DARPA hard problem to solve that that program decided not to focus on that. And they wanted to focus on cognition and action to build trust. So to your point, perception is wickedly complex. And that's where I think the on the loop, your next generation of, of on the loop kind of comes into play. Like what's the human good at? Dealing with that gray-ish level of perceptions of what's really going on here. I heard a radio call, was it a clip radio call 
or hey, that my radar is uh, maybe it's like gadget bent or gadget sick. And so it's not really performing right. So my sensors aren't really feeding the right data or someone's jamming me. And so there, there's all there's thousands of excursions that you can go of nominal off nominal just in the perception side, which then could set everything off on the wrong path, right? 100%. And you you just dovetailed exactly into what I was saying about it being an augmentation of the human's capability. And so you have maybe in the vicinity of the Raptor, and by the vicinity, I don't mean like air show tight. I mean, somewhere in the airspace connected by a data link. Sensors on board these unmanned systems, which are feeding back into sensor fusion on the Raptor F-35 or other four plus generation fighter, or back to command and control authorities, where then they apply the greater levels of understanding of, here's an example. There is a non-zero chance that even when augmented by an unmanned system, you will see on your glass something that is colored hostile, has maybe the attributes of being hostile, but you know it is not as the human because of where it took off of. Maybe there's EA or other things going on. So you know, even though it's colored red, all sorts of electronic or other indications are saying that it is a hostile thing, you will never shoot that because you know, based on your other understanding as a human, point of origin, other flying characteristics, et cetera, that it is not an adversary worthy of applying a weapon to. That is the type of thing where you, again, need a person involved because there are so many nuances or like edge cases, one-off things where the human is on the loop and maybe you'll end up commanding an unmanned system to apply a weapon. And maybe you'll end up commanding the stern convert to VID or something like that. But it's still the human is on the loop. That person in the Raptor at 35 doesn't have an additional sticker throttle flying that, that unmanned system. They give it a, a heading. They give it a, a command of some sort to go fly or maybe just simply you tell it to target. And the word target for 3-1 implies that is your responsibility to go up and to including uh, employing a weapon and ensuring it, it's destruction. That implies a whole bunch of contracts, but again, that's human on the loop, giving the command to target versus an unmanned system doing it all on its own, or you hand flying it through that targeted sequence there. Yeah. I mean, like you, uh, like counter air missions, you know, like XVX, I've got you know four airplanes versus whatever amount of airplanes. And you have your picture, which is why we've settled on this as a, as a, a tactic is if we can describe what the picture is, we have contracts of like, okay, I got the guy on the left, you got the guy on the right. We just label the picture correctly. Everyone knows what you're supposed to do. But then you hit the exploding cantaloupe <laughs> and, and the East guys in the West, the West guys in the East, the trailers, the leader, and like, I don't know what's going on anymore. So you, you know, reset the picture, direct the target, things like that. Like the perception instantly changes and resetting the perception is sometimes the best thing to do for the humans to keep track of what's going on. And It'll be interesting to see how that evolves with the man machine teaming over the next, I mean, the next three or four years is going to be fascinating. What not just the the U.S. military, but all of modern militaries in the world are doing is they're embracing these autonomy equipped vehicles and then they're designing the attributes of these vehicles to do these more dynamic missions. So you see these fighter jet looking drones, whether it's Andrel. General Atomics has uh, has their X-67 out there flying now. That's optimized for a slightly different mission. And the, the UK, the, Japan, everyone has vehicles that look a lot less like a Global Hawk and a Predator and more and more like a fourth gen, fifth gen type fighter. And that's because the autonomy is able to allow the man and machine teaming to go do these more complex dynamic missions where previously was just you know, science fiction, like no way that we could do this only in the movies, right? Only in the movies. No doubt. And you need these performance characteristics of these new systems because it's a contested environment in your long loiter ISR 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 Mach thing is just not going to cut it. You need an air vehicle that has a performance in the fighter realm to conduct fighter style missions because your ISR or bomber for that matter is just, you need to be able to all add some more words that start with D you need to do the five D's of dodgeball sometimes when you're <laughs> flying a fighter, right? You got to dodge dip, duck, dive and dodge, you know? And so you can't be a long loader ISR thing and also conduct fighter missions. And so if we think that the next engagement is not permissive counterterrorism, it is highly contested, highly dynamic 
explosive, then you must have something that can be survivable there. With the Pacific, last thing we'll talk about, none of the drones that we've been talking about, well, with one exception, which is a prototype, the X-47, none of them uh, refuel. So you think that's uh, refueling is really hard. That's really hard too. But going back to the beginning, this is supposed to be focused on the Indo-Pacific. Range and fuel become the biggest limitations of projecting air power across the Pacific. But what are your thoughts on this? If you have the autonomy to be able to refuel the drone, that solves one problem, but it actually creates another because there's not enough tankers anyways to give the manned aircraft the fuel. And so it'll be really interesting to see how you know design choices lead to like operational force choices in the next you know few years call five years or so right no doubt if you listen to anything that the pacific air force's pack aft commander or their subordinate offices talk about every air vehicle manned right now that goes to the boom is going to be criticized and go you get x amount and no more and also no less because you need that very last drop if you use more than that drop, you're going to be steining somebody else who needs it because the vast distances require every drop of gas we can. The Navy has tried to solve some of that getting drogues or getting gas out there with the MQ-25, which I applaud on manned tankers. I'm not going to talk about it as a program. I'm just going to talk about it as a concept and capability is really meaningful because then you can you offload something that is usually a, a man task. So in the Navy in particular, they use Hornets or Super Hornets, I should say, as flying tankers where you'll load it up with multiple bags of gas in order to give just a couple thousand pounds to Hornets who need it. If you can then enable that manned Hornet to go forward and conduct a strike mission because now it doesn't have to be a refueler because an unmanned system provides the refueling, that is a further augmentation of a manned asset. There are all sorts of these low lift areas like a tanker, maybe some logistics where advanced, I would just say automation, like these are level two things, level three things. These are not crazy. You know, when you think about the amount of autonomy required to be an unmanned cargo hauler or, or tanker, effectively use the flight management system or FMS that Garmin puts out right now. You just got to stay on altitude, fly to a waypoint, stay on frequency and uh, do as you're told. And that's a very, it's a gross simplification. But my point is much of what Paco and I are talking about today is pretty high TRL. It's once you get into those nuanced edges, that's when it gets a little bit harder. But much of what we're talking about here is actually pretty high TRL, like six-ish or greater. Certainly on the autopilot, it's nine. And so you have a lot of opportunity to leverage stuff that's on the shelf in order to make a lot of what we're talking about happen. And you're seeing that in Ukraine. You'll see that come out in the Pacific more. Autonomy equipped flying gas stations, man, like the probably one of the more dull missions that you can think of. And if you ask the super Hornet guys that get stuck doing the tanker missions, like, Oh man, I got all day doing an orbit. This is not fun. And so it's like, someone needs your gas, right? But it's meaningful. They got it. It's meaningful. It. It, it, yeah. Very meaningful. And you know, that you're, you know, the MQ 25, it's going to be able to do that mission with almost no autonomy. It's basic autopilot configuration, kind of almost flown like an MQ nine. But when you add and then you inject some autonomy, it can do some other things and you can expand those missions. But to your point, low effort, high impact kind of stuff, like that's a perfect use case. And producer Roger would be very happy to hear that we've been talking about the Navy the past few minutes. So we got to put a plug in for the Navy. There'll be more ship stuff coming up, especially his uh, one of his favorite uh, ships. And we'll let you talk to that in a few episodes. But Scar, thanks for the great conversation today on drones, uh, on how we got here, where we're going. And it's really exciting times to see in the middle of what's going on on the vehicle designs and the applications and the autonomy and the sensors and everything kind of bring it together of how we can partner man and machine to go do these missions and really to prevent conflict to deter and not do have to do the missions, but building that combat credibility in the force. So Scar, thanks for the conversation. And uh, I don't know when we're going to talk next, but uh, we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll get back together in the series before we wrap up. <laughs> no, thanks, Paco. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks to everybody at Authentic and listeners. Please reach out if you have follow-up questions. I'm grateful for the opportunity to chat. So thanks for listening. All right. In our next episode, we're going to be going higher, even higher than what Scar's Raptor used to fly. We're going 12,000 miles higher because we're going to be talking about Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS, 
Everyone just calls it GPS. That is one type of GNSS. We'll talk about how it works, what are the capabilities, limitations, and how the adversaries are exploiting those limitations. And then finally, what are we going to do about it? So that's a topic for another day. But until then, stay on Freak. This is on Future War. Thanks again to Paco and Scar. Next episode, I'll be interviewing retired Navy test pilot and engineer Brian Sunshine Sinclair about GPS and how it or its absence will affect future peer level conflict. If you've enjoyed this program, you can find additional commentary, interviews, and in depth series on current affairs and military aviation at Authentic Media on YouTube or on your podcast provider of choice. On Future War is brought to you through partnership with Cubic Defense. For over 50 years, Cubic has been facilitating warfighter readiness to prevail on night one and beyond.